millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. Nerdwallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Unless you've been living under a rock the last few weeks, you know that something has been going on between Reddit, GameStop, investors like you and me in the old hedge fund world. I called upon our resident investing expert, Michelle Snyder from Market Gauge to help us dissect just what happened and what you need to know as an investor going forward. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Come to Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Perhaps this is what we needed, a new story beyond COVID and politics. And the stage was set, right? And in a relatively short period of time, everyone on the Reddit board was poised and ready to cause some serious pain to the old hedge fund investors by driving the stock price of GameStop systematically, which was also an ailing company, up and up and up. As with any investing story, there are winners and losers and those that just get caught in the crosshairs of this tug of war between investors like you and me and big time hedge fund investors. So let's let Mish unravel this a little bit for us. We certainly have a lot to talk about because it is on the lips of everybody. I mean, people who never, ever, ever, ever thought about trading the market (laughs) are actually texting us, calling us. I know talking about it with other friends. I've had um, kids that are 12 years old asking me, well, what, you know, what's, what should I do? Do you think I should get involved in the market? And to me, this is thrilling. It's just so thrilling. But you want to put a little context on it. Let's just go through a little history. Because even though it seems like it's a brand new thing, and certainly the age group of getting younger is a new thing, in reality, the idea of short squeezes and retail investors coming in and taking over the market is not so new. Um, It's just interesting that it's happened the way it has. So let's, let's step back. First of all, as you know, I've been in the market for a long time, and I started trading the market back in the days of hyperinflation, which, uh, yeah, hasn't happened in 40 years, and we actually think it could happen again. Uh, But nonetheless, it was a time when silver and gold went nuts. Silver, and I'm going to pick on silver here, went from $5 to $50 in a matter of a very short period of time, which was a 1,000% move, which is startling. Uh, yeah. Um, I, when you sound the numbers now, that sounds so cheap. But really, if you just look at in terms of uh, relative performance, it was also at a time, I have to tell you, where um, the Dow was trading a thousand. Now that's trading over 30,000. So that gives you some perspective of how cheap 
things can be relative to what the indices are doing. And then uh, there was a short squeeze in silver. The Hunt brothers were the famous brothers that tried to corner the silver market. And what happened at that point was that the government, well, first of all, trading platforms stepped in just like they did with silver the other day. They started raising the margins, which makes it much more expensive to buy and hold any silver Number one. And number two is finally they came in uh, the CFTC, which is the controlling governance of the commodities exchange, and they raised uh, they they made the uh, uh, ability to buy silver uh, illegal. Mm, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, of course, what happened was that the hunts were forced to liquidate. And as a result of that, they um, lost all their money and all the brokerage platforms that were trading with them lost their money. And interestingly enough, I was trading for Conti Commodities and Coffee Sugar Cocoa, and they gave me a seat and I lost my seat. So I lost my job as a result of that. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) That's why I remember it so well. And then off I went. So so the reason why I'm bringing that up is because history repeats itself. I like to say it just looks – complexion changes. So now let's go back now to the fast forward to 2020. So it's pandemic, market crashes. Come April, people get stimulus checks. Many, many people from young people to older people are home. They can't go out. And they figure the market's cheap. The government is adding money here. I'm going to stop buying stocks. So we start to see a phenomenon that goes on where retail investors are actually making more money than the institutional investors who were not buying at that point. They were slow Mm. to the party. And the retail investors are driving up the market. At that point, whether hedge funds were short or not, I I, I don't know. I didn't research that part because it's not necessarily relevant. What's more relevant is the fact that this retail boom started in April. And retail just really means means the individual investor, investor. Yeah, right, like right. you and me, not a hedge right. fund, right? So, or an institutional investor like a bank. Um, you know, if your financial planners are, are 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 essentially trading for you as a retail investor, unless they're part of a fund, that's something else. And these are good things for people to find out. By the way, is if my money is somewhere like your like your four hundred ones, by the way. And this is this is the interesting twist of this whole story is that. The retail investor in these Reddit groups are saying, you know, it's us against the suits. But a lot of the suits are controlling a huge percentage of 401s and retirement accounts. (laughs) Mm, Okay. Yeah. So you're not just screwing the suits. You're also screwing maybe your parents and your grandparents. But, you know, that's, that's, that's neither here nor there right now. It's just something that I don't think most people are aware of. But anyway, stepping back. So and now social media, of course, is the other huge factor here because uh, people start banding together to talk about stock ideas and Reddit is born and Wall Street bet is born. And these become platforms and forums for figuring out what to buy and sell. And what's involved through that is as they were talking, they started, and I don't know exactly how they landed on this idea, but they started looking at stocks like GameStop. BlackBerry, Tootsie Roll, AMC, <laughs> and seeing that they were really, really cheap with a huge. Yeah, I was. I was going to ask you, like, d- did you know, like, was there a a methodology or a rationale behind GameStop, or it was just another sort of random stock that they found? I think it was. I think it may have started out more randomly, <clears throat> and then I think when they realized that they were onto something, that hedge funds were being forced to cover. Not only did it become more than just a random type of trade, but now it became a social phenomenon and sort of a David Goliath type situation. And then, of course, you got everybody jumping on that bandwagon. And then, of course, you got the cause celeb, the new cause celeb, which is we're going to help these little guys make money and we're going to screw it to the man, so to speak. That's the Hollywood version. Right. You know. And actually, the funny thing is, Shan, I just read that Netflix and Amazon Prime and a couple of other places are already talking about making a movie about this. Of course. I mean, course. you know, why wouldn't they, right? <laughs> exactly. Everybody wants to get in on the game. And it is a great story. It'll be interesting to see how the perspective is on it. But anyway, so let's talk about hedge funds for a second and we'll go back. So what do hedge funds do? Hedge funds have to leverage 
their accounts. So they obviously have fixed income. They buy certain stocks uh, that are, you know, the stronger stocks. Generally, they'll stick to things like the FANG stocks, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, yada, yada. Um, They may get involved in some other instruments along the way, but they look for companies that they feel are at risk and they go short. And hedge funds have been given a tremendous amount of freedom lately because, first of all, nobody has done any regulation in terms of the fact that they can literally bankrupt a company by driving the stock price down to almost zero. That Mm -hmm. has not been something that the government has looked into, you know, and I think that gives some uh, credibility to the, the Reddits saying, hey, not fair, not fair. The other thing is, of course, as we know that uh, hedge funds are basically, you know, paying very little tax. And of course, with the government keeping the interest rates down, it's really made everything so easy to borrow money. And they've been bailed out along the way. They're still getting bailed out with this recent phenomenon that happened. And hedge funds are dealing with massive amounts of money, right? There's a lot of money pouring in and out. Billions, right. The good hedge funds are running. uh, They have assets under management in the billions. So, yeah, different. So, um, so now all of a sudden, let's go back. So now the Wall Street bet crowd, totally transparent, by the way. It wasn't like it's insider trading or anything like that. See that they're on to something with GameStop. Obviously, as you know, drove that price from $20 all the way up to $500. <clears throat> And everybody starts screaming that the hedge funds are losing money. And again, what wasn't really talked about much was that so are a lot of the people who have their IRAs in it. Uh, And number two is that um, they are uh, now under the guise of the government and the SEC and Elizabeth Warren and now Janet Yellen and they're going to meet and yada, yada, yada. So let's go back to what happened with the Hunt brothers. Put a, it ended the party pretty quickly. Only the party is a little different right now because it's a much larger movement mm-hmm. and it's gotten celebrity attention. And it does really bring into question the whole idea of how much regulation should there be? How free is the free market? Yeah, those are huge questions. T- talk us through a little bit because I know people are really confused about this. Is there a simple way to explain uh, short selling and uh, short squeeze? Yes. So in 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 stocks, some stocks are called hard to borrow, which means you you cannot go short them. But other stocks, you can basically on an on a buy tick. You can short it. You can sell there. So basically what you're doing is you're selling in anticipation that the price is going to fall. You don't own the stock, obviously, because you're selling the stock. You are borrowing it with the anticipation that you will cover it at some point. That's the simplest way I can describe it. We are mostly geared to think about buying stocks, but selling stocks is extremely lucrative. In fact, on the commodities exchange, we used to say it's the staircase up and the elevator down because things can fall rapidly. So with a very limited supply of stocks, we literally have about half the number of stocks that we used to have to trade on the board. These hedge funds would b- find these companies in order to leverage their, their, their exposure to the market, they would sell the companies or go short the companies that they thought would go down. Now, GameStop is a perfect example. And actually, if you really want to look in history, go look at Piggly Wiggly. Uh, Piggly- <laughs> <laughs> because Piggly Wiggly, well, in 1919, the institutional investors were selling that stock, driving it down the toilet. The guy who was the CEO almost went bankrupt. He started getting a bunch of retail investors to come in and buy that stock. They got a short squeeze. He made a lot of his money back. And he, what he probably should have done was just gotten out of debt and moved on. Unfortunately, this is really where the good lesson and we'll get to what happens with you know greed. But nonetheless, he didn't do that. The regulators came in. They stopped allowing him to buy the shares. The hedge funds came back, sold it, and he wound up losing everything. Now, Piggly Wiggly, by the way, still exists, which I didn't even know. I've never seen yes. a Piggly Wiggly in my life, but all right, whatever. So, <laughs> so, so GameStop. 
So GameStop, I don't, I don't know about by you, but I can tell you that the one GameStop that I see here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, has a big going out of business sign on it. And Same, some, yes. Yeah, right. So there's some fundamental reasons. People, obviously the pandemic, people aren't going into stores anyway. And two, you can do all of this stuff online in terms of the gaming. And I have never been in a GameStop in my life, so I can't even tell you what's in there. But I assume it's the type of video games that you could probably now do online. So just from a mega trend, it was kind of a dying thing. The fact that you can go short a company like that is not crazy. It's unfortunate for GameStop because it, it, it drives them into the bankruptcy that we're seeing. But mm. on the other hand, that's just life. Things, things evolve, innovative things come out, and old school way goes down the toilet. And there, I mean, there have been movies about this. One of the most famous plays and movie about that is Other People's Money. And, yes. uh, yeah, which is really all about that. It's about venture capitalists going into a steel factory, I think it was, and saying they're taking them over because basically they've become obsolete. It kills the jobs for all those people who live in that town. But on the other hand, can't be avoided. So that's what happened with GameStop until you got the Reddit crowd in there and the, and the Wall Street bet. Now, I know they're hunting. If you look at GameStop as we're talking today, something incredible is happening. It's actually reducing its volatility and its trading inside the trading range of yesterday, Tuesday. That's consolidation. So that's a whole other thing. And I think we should probably spend some time talking about the lessons that one can learn from this in terms of their own investing when you, when you want. If you have any more questions on this, though, happy to answer them. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So, how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful. 
ad-free and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Want to know the number one money question I'm asked? It's how to get started investing without being overwhelmed. So if you're asking yourself the same question, then you have to check out the Investing for Beginners podcast. The hosts, Dave and Andrew, they break down investment terms and strategies in a way you can finally understand. I love that they're making investing accessible and they have an entire podcast dedicated to helping you invest better. Even if you're not ready to start investing, they explain the stock market and financial updates so you can really understand what is being said on the news. If you're ready to learn more about investing, I'd recommend you start with two of my favorite episodes. Listener Q&A, how do you start investing with a thousand bucks? Where they explain how you get started right away. And back to basics of building your portfolio, where they explain how to build a portfolio from scratch. The Investing for Beginners podcast is a great way to start expanding your relationship with money. Find Investing for Beginners podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hi, I'm Karina Bemisterfer, host of Morning Cup of Murder, your daily true crime podcast. Yes, you heard me right. Daily true crime. Every day, Morning Cup of Murder tells you a straightforward, short-form story about murder, true crime, cold cases, disappearances, serial killers, cults, and more. And I do that all in under 15 minutes. With over three years of stories and over 20 million downloads, the Morning Cup of Murder podcast has become a staple of so many people's daily routines. So why not add it to yours? Stream Morning Cup of Murder everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, stay safe. Everyone knows that putting money aside in savings is really important. But then what? Should you keep your savings locked in a CD for a higher rate or keep them liquid in a money market? Can your checking account help you save too? Or is it about creating the right combination? We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about the savings options that are right for you. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com. Member FDIC. Okay, let's take a little podcast time out here and talk a little bit about greed. (laughs) Now, greed is a normal human emotion that most of us has felt from time to time. We want more, especially when we're talking about money. And more isn't always a bad thing, but at what cost? What are you willing to risk for more? I think one of the most important investing lessons that Mish will talk about a little later in this episode is the idea of knowing when to get in and when to get out of a particular stock or fund. So for example, let's say I go into GameStop at say 350, just about $100 offish from the high, thinking that per the Reddit board, it was going to go up to like $1,000 and I would make a ton of cash only to find out that the stock is now back down to sub $100 level, meaning I might have lost a lot of cash in that scenario. Maybe I should have said, okay, if the stock goes to 400, you know what, I'm out. And also, if the stock drops to 300, I'm out too. So just a little food for thought, like really try to keep greed in check, especially in scenarios like this, take your profits. And don't look back at someone else who's saying that they made a lot of money, or that you can make a lot more money, you got to keep your greed in check. Okay, back to our regular programming. Yeah, just to, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, about this app that's super popular with younger people, Robinhood, and their sort of involvement or non-involvement or getting caught up in the middle here. I don't know exactly what happened, but basically limiting, stopping and limiting um, average people like you and me from going in and buying GameStop, you know, what can you say about Robin Hood and how that all that mess kind of all happened? Well, right. Robin Hood became the place that that everybody was opening up accounts because of the fact that they weren't charging any commission. But what they were doing was selling that order flow. So in other words, you get a block of orders to buy X, Y, Z at 
$10. And then they were selling that order flow to hedge funds who have algos, have machines basically, that they can front run those orders or sell into those orders for a few dollars. When I say a few dollars, I mean they make a lot of money, but I mean in terms of the actual price fluctuation, they're not looking for a lot of money in that situation. So Robin Hood mm. became the hero of the new investor. They didn't realize that their information was being sold. That, and even if they did, they probably didn't care very much. They were paying nothing to trade. And they could do fractal trading too, by the way, where they could, you know, a whole bunch of kids could join together and uh, cumulatively buy a stock using different accounts. So hero, right? From hero to villain, because it turns out that not only did they find out that they were selling this information, but they were the first ones to shut down the trading in GameStop and uh, BlackBerry and uh, AMC and Tootsie Roll and some of the others that they were doing. So now Robinhood, which is about to have an IPO, which looked like it might be the hottest IPO around, now all of a sudden uh, all these kids went to different platforms. Any platform that was going to allow them to trade, that's where they ran off to. Do you think that... Um that once sort of the dust settles, like people will come clobbering back to Robin Hood? Like, do we have that short of a intention span? <laughs> well, we definitely have a short intention span, no <laughs> doubt about that. Uh, but I think more importantly, it's going to be what Robin Hood, who Robin Hood decides to, 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 to side with. There mm. are plenty of other brokerage firms that uh, actually are coming out as a result of this, but also even before this, um, uh, Wed, Wedbush, Wedbush? We, 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 Weeble, 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 Weeble is another one, and they all flocked there because they did not limit the trading on uh, those stocks. Um, so I don't know if Robinhood will come back from this. I mean, the I irony, of course, is the fact that Robinhood is the legend of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. And it turned out, you know, when Sheriff Nottingham showed up at the door, they immediately sided with the rich. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <Yeah>. Whoops. <laughs> right. Don't know. Don't know. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you whether they'll, people will forget and go back into Robin Hood or they'll just be uh, new places like Webull and other platforms. I know that we've been looking at other platforms, too, uh, as we find out more and more about how order flow works when things get very volatile and whether or not orders are being sold to uh, other places, to hedge funds and institutional investors. Um, I think that's something that's going to be looked at. And of course, <laughs> no regulation there or even threat of it right at this moment. Only right. how can we stop the retail investors from manipulating the market? The fact is, if where do you where do you draw the line? Everybody, yeah. I mean, the Fed has been manipulating the, manipulating the market for the last several years. Right. We just don't hear about that a lot. <laughs> the average person. Well, we don't right. care. We don't care because we're happy because they're manipulating the market for the market to go up. And that makes everybody happy. Yes. Great point. So <laughs> what would you say to somebody listening who is having like a severe case of, of FOMO of feeling like they, they missed out? You know, do you do you get in these things when you know, you're hearing no, news stories about this? Or um, is that sort of your caution bell to like stand back and, and watch what's happening from afar and don't put your money in? Well, I don't know if there's an easy, easy answer, but I think that the government is about to actually throw more stimulus money out, which means we're going to get a whole new crew of people who are going to say, wow, I just got another $1,200 or $1,000 or whatever they decide upon from the government. And oh, I think this is a good time to open up an account with Webull and start trading stocks that seem beat up. And that may still be a legitimate uh, strategy. So this is what I encourage people to do is, first of all, nobody needs to become a fundamental specialist. You know, you don't have to go in there and crunch numbers about the earnings and da 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 da. da. I, that would make my head explode. But at, <laughs> but at least have an idea of what the social trend is or the political trend is or the economic trend is. So in this case, you look at a stock like GameStop and you say, okay, from a mega trend, probably not going to last too long because more and more businesses are online. From a political trend right now, it's the cause celeb. And from, an, uh, uh, from a social trend, it's certainly uh, a way for some sense of revolution against the suits. 
And so you that's the thought process you have to have is, does it make sense? You all can think. And if you can't think, you can certainly look on Twitter. There's plenty of other people who are thinking about this all the time. You can look at these opinions, but you just put hashtag, whatever it is you're interested in. And trust me, you will get pages and pages of commentary and whatever resonates with you. You can go, aha. Okay. So for all these reasons, I'm going to think that right now, GameStop is a good investment. It's come off all this way, and um, and yet it's still a hot topic. And so far, there's been no regulate, real regulation. I'm going to buy it. That's the first thing, is think before you buy. Don't just jump in. Number two is think about how much you're willing to risk. This is something that the market humbles you so fast on. Think about the people who got in at like $400 in GameStop. Because they right. thought it was just going to keep going up, been up, been up. And they never, ever, ever, ever thought about the risk. Hmm, what if I'm wrong? How much money am I willing to lose? So the other lesson, and this is something that's in my book, we, of course, is think about what's your stop loss? What, how much money are you willing to risk? And at what price do you get out and say, I'm wrong? Never mind. The other side of that is once you're making money, then, then play with the casino's money, so to speak, and raise that risk to no loss. So if you get in at 95 and your risk is to under 90, you don't get stopped out. It goes to 100. Put your stop now at 95, no loss, nothing lost, nothing gain. And now you're playing casino money. And then the third thing is come up with some kind of profit target. Yeah, take some profits when you get a move from 20 to 500, really. I mean, people wait yeah. <laughs> lifetimes to get a move like that. So just say, okay, if I bought it at 95, let's just use that same example. And now I have a no loss at 95 and it's trading over 100. Gee, you know, if it gets to 200, I'm going to take some profit. And then raise your stop again. If it gets to 300, you know, use hundred dollar increments when you're getting through that kind of volatility. And if you're not, if you're just going out and buying any particular instrument because you like it, obviously you're not going to use hundred dollar instruments, uh, increments, excuse me, but you're going to use some increment on based on what you risk. If you risk five bucks, you want to try to make 10, then you want to try to make four times your risk and then six times your risk and then eight times your risk, always taking a little bit money off the table because this is a tr day trading world right here or a very short term trading if you're going to get in on these hot movement stocks. Yeah, yeah. Wow, such great advice. So okay, are there are there any other lessons or, or takeaways that you think we should have from this whole this whole scenario? Well, yeah, I think the biggest thing is, yay, yes, the stock market is a fantastic place to become familiar with. It's a really good place to make money. It changed my life some 40 years ago as I started out in special education, really making nothing. And I've seen it change the lives of people. And I think it's a wonderful, it's still, unless the government screws with it, the purest bastion of capitalism because it doesn't care who you are, where you're from, what you look like, what color you are, what your sexual preference is, all of that is completely irrelevant. It's just pure money. And so I think that this is a good time, if you get nothing else out of this, to say, wow, there is opportunity in the market. Get yourself some education. There are a plethora of people who actually teach about what to do, of course, ourselves included. But yeah, that's what I would I would say is if you're young, especially great time to get in the game, because if you lose money, you know, you have plenty of time to figure it out and make money along the way. If you're an older person, obviously, you may want to be more cautious. But nonetheless, yeah, this is this is great. This is great news, I think, for the market right here. I love it. I think that's that's like the perfect takeaway. <laughs> if this teaches you anything, <laughs> it should show you that if you if you do it, quote unquote, correctly, and you don't get too greedy, uh, that you could really have uh, life changing opportunities with investing. Absolutely. And you don't have to make it all in one shot. It's a for me, it's been a lifetime game. And yeah, I, uh, I yeah, love it. yeah. So there, there you go. And um, yeah, and go watch the movie Trading Places if you want to learn about short squeezes. And then go watch the movie Other People's Money if you want to learn about sort of obsolescence. <laughs> <laughs> Two movies to watch while you're home, waiting for everything to come back to normal. I love that our homework is to go watch movies. I think that's something that everybody <laughs> listening is like, okay, I can actually I can wrap my head around that one. <laughs> so you have your homework, right? Go watch a few movies 
and do your own thinking about what you can take away as an investor or future investor from all of this. The truth is, investors like you and me, we're just going to keep pushing. We're going to keep trying to find ways to shift wealth from the uber rich to maybe our pockets if we're lucky. We're going to keep trying to use technology to break down some barriers. So why not learn what you can and then go apply it smartly to your own investing? If you want to learn more about Mish, here is where you can find her. Well, since we were talking about Twitter, uh, I'm on Twitter a lot, and that's at Market Minute, one word. Uh, And also, if you just go to our website, marketgage.com, uh, there's a blog that uh, we write every day, one that my husband does with a video uh, every week. There's a lot of free content, a lot of good information. Um, and also Instagram. I'm on Instagram and I put a lot of info. I do morning stories. That's my new thing, my f- Twitter fleets and morning stories. And I give tips. So yesterday or two days ago, I mentioned to buy oil. Uh, and oil has gone up about uh, 7% since then. So there, yeah, there are ways to find me if you want to find me. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com, where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future too and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com slash wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.